Good morning. Welcome to Orchard Lake Community Church, Presbyterian. Looking forward to the service. I'd like to make some announcements. Some of them are, in fact, they're all pulled from your bulletin, but I want to highlight these. The first one is the Messiah coming to our church. It's going to be directed by Bruce. And the dates are Friday, December the 1st at 7 p.m. and Sunday, December 3rd at 4 p.m. Tickets can be purchased out in the Lakeview room after each service. So keep that in mind. That'll make it convenient for you if you're not comfortable going online <clears throat> to purchase tickets. I think this is important for the congregation. There will be a congregational meeting. The session is called a congregational meeting to act upon the report of the permanent nominating committee immediately following the 10.30 a.m. worship service on Sunday, December 10th. I'd like to call your attention to the Christmas store collection for the Baldwin Center. That'll be going on from now through November 30th, which is Thursday. So not much time. And I'd also like to bring to your attention the ladies' Christmas tea. That'll be Saturday, December 9th at 2 p.m. here at the church. You can sign up today in the Lakeview area. <clears throat> uh, now, before we stand to greet our neighbors and, and pass the friendship pad, I want to remind you that there are yellow prayer cards, requests that you can fill out in the pew rack. And if you would, you can fill those out and then they'll be collected later uh, at the time when we're, when we're going to be singing. Anyway, let's move on. Greet your neighbor, stand and greet your neighbor, and wish them well. All right, if everybody could find their seats, we're going to be treated to a piece that has a familiar title, Jesus Loves Me, but with a special, a special treat for us as played by Wayman this morning for us.
Thank you. That was that was really wonderful. Now let's do the call to worship. It's found from Psalm 62. I'll read and then you'll read. For God alone my soul longs. Everything I need comes from God. So why wouldn't I wait for the Lord? God is the solid rock under my feet, breathing room for my soul. Since God is an impregnable castle, I'm set for life when I lean upon the Lord. Now let's stand and sing hymn 223, Crown Him with Many Crowns. If you'll join me in the prayer of the people, we'll read together. Our merciful God, you willingly pardon all who repent and turn to you. In this hour, we humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy upon us. Give us a greater desire to bear the troubles of others. You ask that we love you with a pure heart and love others as much as we love ourselves. Give us the desire to sacrifice moments from our schedules to investigate and seek to alleviate the pain in our world. Deliver us from the proud thoughts we harbor. Let us be humble in spirit, kind in heart, and gentle in our language. With gratitude for your compassion and love, we pray for our loved ones, family, and friends. Amen. Thank you. 
Now it's time for the children's moment with Pastor Rich. Good morning, good morning. Today is a special day in the church that we call Christ the King Sunday. We call it Christ the King Sunday. Now, around the world today, if you looked at a big globe, there are about 30 people in countries who will wake up today and someone in that country will call them king or queen. About 30 countries around our world have kings and queens. We don't have that in our country, do we? We don't have kings and queens here, but 30 countries do. Now, are kings and queens usually poor or rich? They're rich, aren't they? Just how rich? Very rich? Very, very. Well, I'm going to need your help. I need seven of you to stand up for me, and you're going to be my helpers because we're going to give a quiz to the congregation to see how well the congregation knows about the wealth of royals in our world. Who are the wealthiest royals in our world today? So I'm going to have you hold this number seven. Hold it right like that, and when I ask, you're going to just hold on up here. Don't do it yet, but you're going to hold it right against your tummy, and then that bottom part will fall down, and then they'll be able to see the answer, the answer that they've gotten right already. Okay, you're going to hold that? Hold it right up against your tummy. There you go. Okay, you're number five. The choir, I don't want them to see the answers. <laughs> Trying to be very sneaky here and get it up real tight against your chest so you don't give the choir all the... So they'd look so smart back here and smug. The choir would get everything right. There we go. Okay. Oh, come on. You're... There's, there we go, right there. And Rachel, you guys want to work on that together? You kind of hold that together. Num number one right there. Put that right against your tummy. There you go. Got it? Okay. Now, who would like to volunteer the answer, the correct answer only, for the seventh wealthiest royal household in the world today? It's, a, it's so obvious that I mean, it's just, I hate to say this, I mean, it's just so obvious. It's on the tip of your tongue. The Windsors? Who? Morocco? That's a good guess. That's a good guess. England? No. Denmark? Another good guess. No, not the Netherlands. Let's see. Can you hold just this yellow part and let that drop? The seventh most wealthy royal family is from Brunei. That was on the tip of your tongue, wasn't it? You were thinking Brunei all the time and going, I don't want to show off that I know it's Brunei. Little island in the south, you know, in Indonesia. Okay, sixth, sixth. Now, people have been to this place. Some people have been here. You've traveled to this place, some of you. Monaco? Monaco? No. You said Thailand? Excellent answer. Wow. Let's see if you can hold that little yellow part and let that bottom drop. There we go. Thailand. Who thought the Thai royal family would be the sixth wealthiest royal family in the world? You did. Okay, I'm going to sit down. Mark, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, number five. Now, a lot of you have been to this country. The... Not Japan. Somebody over here said it earlier. The UK, right. Let's drop it. They're only the fifth wealthiest. Boy, we think they've got a lot of money. Wait till you see. Okay, number four. Who's going to volunteer number four? These all kind of fit in now one region of the world where you can guess where the money comes from. Saudi Arabia is a good guess, yeah. Yes. Jordan, another good guess. Let's see who it is. Drop it. Number four is 
Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. Anybody ever been there to ski or water ski or no? Number three, who's got number three? Any guesses? What's that? He said Saginaw. I don't think it's Saginaw. <laughs> the Principality of Saginaw. I'd like to see that. That would be neat. Let's see number three. Go ahead and drop it. It is Cutter. Cutter is the third wealthiest. Number two. And guess? Drop it. It is Kuwait. Kuwait's the second wealthiest royal family in the world. And number one, by far and away, that's double the second wealthiest family. They're so far ahead. Rachel, go ahead and drop it. It is Saudi Arabia. About one and a half trillion dollars worth of money held by the royal family alone of Saudi Arabia. More than double the next, and, and as you go down the line, those folks in the UK, they're paupers. They're paupers compared to the folks in Saudi Arabia. Okay, everybody have a seat real quick. A lot of these people have a lot of money and they rule over areas of land, but today we are talking about Christ the King, and the story today is that Christ is King not of one little country like Denmark or Norway or UK or Qatar or Abu Dhabi. Christ is King of the whole world. So all these people who get people to do all sorts of things for them and parade around because they're the most important people in their country, they're not the most important people ever because we celebrate Jesus as King of the world today, Christ the King Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to worship you who is in charge of all creation Lord, let our worship of you be true today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Today's New Testament reading can be found on page 200 in the Pew Bible. I'll be reading Colossians 1, 15 through 20 from the New King James Version. <clears throat> he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and an invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him. For whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The word of the Lord. Before I share prayer requests, I wanted to be sure that um, everyone in the congregation is aware that if you receive a random email from me asking for special help in a project that is known only to you, it wasn't from me. So there are a couple staff members and others in the church who have received emails and have said, what is the special project you need my help on exactly? Well, there isn't one. 
If I think of one, I'll let you know. <laughs> but I'm sorry about that. That's the world in which we live. There are several uh, prayer requests, but I wanted to begin with just the joy from the Carpenter family. A little uh, granddaughter was born in Houston, and uh, I believe Jacob is the name of the father, and the uh, mom and child are doing terrific. I want to also thank the deacons for all of your wonderful support for the families who are experiencing grief in our church. Our deacon, Board of Deacons is just doing a wonderful work uh, reaching out to people and, and sharing the love of Christ with them in these very, very difficult times in their lives. And I want to thank the deacons for all of their great work. Now let us pray. Our great and glorious God, you are the living God of this world and the next. All glory be yours as we bring to you the gifts of our hearts and our lives. Thank you for loving us so and for giving us the countless blessings we know as heirs of the true King. Lord, we pray that all grace, peace, and mercy would be upon those whom we know are suffering at this time. We pray for Maureen and her family. We pray for Barb, for Marion, for Carol, and Sandra. We pray for the 10-month-old grandson diagnosed with a brain defect. Lord, I pray for healing for him and strength for the family. We pray for Mary going through difficult times, for Connie to have good news about a bone marrow donor, we pray for those parts of our world that are filled with strife and violence. Pray for those who are being held hostage as we worship. Lord, bless them with a return to their homes and families again. Continue to bless our church, Lord, and allow the love expressed through the leadership of our mission committee and all who generously have donated so many wonderful things for those in need. We pray that those would shine as a light to those who are seeking a place of faith and seeking the grace of God. Silence in us all the voices of the world that shout to be heard in our minds and hearts. Help us to open our minds and hearts this hour fully to the life-changing power of your word, your song, and your spirit. May all glory be ascribed to your holy name as we together pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
reading from Judges chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Now Abimelech, son of Jerubbaal, went to Shechem to his mother's kinsfolk and said to them and the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the hearing of all the lords of Shechem, Which is better for you that all seventy of the sons of Jerubbaal rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. So his mother's kinsfolk spoke all these words on his behalf in the hearing of all the lords of Shechem, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. And they said, He is our brother. They gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the temple of Baal Barith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. He went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jerubbaal, 70 men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest, of the son, youngest son of Jerubbaal, survived, for he hid himself. Then all the lords of Shechem and all Beth Milo came together, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. The word of the Lord. There's a great theologian of the 20th century by the name of Paul Tillich, and Paul Tillich used to warn about the danger of using too many symbols in the church because he would say, you know, we try to communicate ideas through symbols, but sometimes the symbol cannot convey what we're trying to communicate, that the symbol can't have the entirety of what it is we're trying to communicate to others, so we should do with fewer symbols, Tillich reasoned. He said the symbols of the church, of course, originated with the Middle Ages when people were illiterate and did not have access to the scriptures themselves. So there were symbols placed everywhere, like the beautiful symbols that we have on our windows, like the symbols that I have on my very own stole that remind us of pieces and parts, if you will, of the character of God alive and well in our lives today. Well, I'm not going to crash anyone's party on symbols today. I think symbols do a wonderful job of reminding us of the different facets of God's life among us and God's direction for us. But there are a couple of symbols I wanted to highlight that symbols that are unusual to us. One symbol was a peacock. The peacock was painted on church murals and ceilings to represent God. The peacock was an ancient symbol used in the church of Jesus Christ. It was Because the ancient Greeks believed the peacock's body did not decompose after death. So the peacock became a symbol of immortality in the church. You would see a peacock, and if you look at the ancient Dutch masters down at the Detroit Institute of Arts, you'll see many peacocks in the corners of the paintings of the ancient Dutch masters from the Middle Ages. Well, the pelican was another symbol for God in ancient artwork. Medieval Europeans believed that pelicans were particularly attentive to their young, even to the point of wounding themselves. A peacock would wound itself. The peacock mother would wound itself if there were no food available so that the peacock young, or the pelican young, could then drink the blood of the mother and sustain themselves. This pelican reminded ancient Christians of the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for us. Finally, the fish. The fish was a popular symbol for Jesus because of many miracles Jesus did with fish in his lifetime. And even the Greek word for fish, which is ichthus, that you can see on the screen, that can be made into an acrostic using the consonants and representing this. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, ichthus. I think symbols actually do help us understand, but they can't possibly communicate the entirety of what we wish for them to represent. This day, we recognize another symbol in the life of the church. It is Christ the King Sunday, the final Sunday in the liturgical Christian calendar. The next Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, is actually the first Sunday 
in the liturgical Christian calendar. So this is the apex Sunday. This is the final Sunday of our church calendar year. Today we refer to Christ as King, but in some of our hearts and minds, that carries a lot of baggage with it when you think of kingship or a queen. When we call God a king, we think of all sorts of attributes, some of which are not good attributes, as we have read about the English monarchs over the years and other monarchs around the world. We say, okay, kingship for God, I, I, I hope that God's a little better than the kings of, whom we, which, of which we read. Because down through history, rulers have forced people to obey, rulers could not be challenged, and rulers lived as though they deserved every measure of pomp and circumstance offered to them. In fact, there were royals who believed that they were godlike simply because they were born into that family. Beneath all of its gold and jewels, the crown of French monarchs supposedly contained a fragment of the crown of thorns placed on Jesus' head. The French monarchs truly believed that some of the crown of thorns that Jesus wore was in their crown in France. Yet a quick reading of history will show you that French royals lived a life that bore no resemblance to the life of Jesus our Lord. But that's the way we expect royals might live. Kings and queens seem to live in another world than we live in. Royals will spend money freely because they can always get more money from people who are subjects. Royals will enjoy first class everything and have people wait on them all day long. There's great temptations for royals. The wealth and attention come so easily for those who have power that I believe the excuses for misbehavior come just as easily for those who have power. When people fawn over your every word or action, it would be pretty easy to miscalculate your place in this world. Royals can believe that the rules of life that the rest of us live by don't seem to apply to them. Well, now we come to the Old Testament lesson from Judges. Because Abimelech was an Old Testament king who provides a perfect example of one who believed that the rules didn't matter to him. Abimelech happened to be born into the right sort of family. He had all sorts of good connections. He was an assertive personality. He had high aspirations, and he had great social skills. And when it time, came time for Israel to name their very first king, Abimelech thought, I want that first king to be me. So, to begin his campaign, he traveled to his mother's hometown to rally support for his campaign, if you will, much like our modern politicians will do so today. The politicians who, who want to get national recognition often will start in their home state and say, I want these people to rally behind me because I've served you so well. Now let's go take the nation and we'll tell everyone how great I was serving this state, this municipality, this region. Well, that's exactly what Abimelech did. He went to his mother's hometown to rally support for him. At the gathering in his mother's hometown, Abimelech asked this question, which is better for you that all 70 of the sons of Jerubbaal rule over you or that one rule over you? Actually, it sounds like kind of a reasonable question. Would you rather pay taxes to support 70 rulers or pay taxes to support one ruler? Would you rather have the capricious notions of 70 judges to follow or just listen to the whims of one judge to follow? Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Let's do away with all those others and just support one and we'll be like all the other nations around us. So for many generations, the Israelites rejected the whole idea of having a king because they had a king. The Lord God Almighty was the king who spoke to the judges, who spoke to the prophets, who then addressed all the people about what God wished for them to do. They didn't need a king as an intermediary. They had judges and prophets who were already there to share the word of the Lord with them. 
But over time, the people came to envy, envy the elaborate courts of the regional tribal leaders near them and the concentrated power of their neighbors. Hearing Abimelech's speech, people decided they wanted a king. It sounds like a good idea to them. And the residents of his mother's hometown even reached into the community till at the temple and took out all the silver coins and gave them to Abimelech for his campaign fund. It was a quick fundraiser. He went to mom's hometown, said, I need some money. I need you guys to support me. They went to the temple, took the money out of the temple and said, Abimelech, you're our guy. Go around and, and you will be elected king, rule over all. But instead of using that campaign money to travel to other villages and rally more support, the Bible says Abimelech used the money, quote, to hire worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. What he did with the money was to hire enforcers, if you will, in a very tight-knit group around him. As he thought about becoming king, he decided the surest way to kingship is simply eliminate the competition. If you're the only one from the right family left standing, why, you're going to be king. And that's what he did. Those worthless and reckless fellows he hired using the money from the temple of his mother's hometown they became his own mercenary fighting force. But instead of using that tight-knit group of enforcers around him to, to fend off entreaties from foreign people, other tribal groups that might be coming into Israel, he used it to stamp down any dissent within his own nation. It was like a scene out of the Godfather movie. The Bible says Abimelech basically hired hitmen to kill the male members who could legitimately challenge his claim for the throne. Seventy brothers, cousins, and relatives were killed. The youngest only escaped. And after that massacre happened, I'll give you one guess as to whom the lords of Shechem decided to vote as their king. That's right, Abimelech, the last man standing, was elected by the lords of Shechem to say, hey, Abimelech, you'll be our king, because after all, you're the only one fit for the job, and we're all fearful if we don't install you as king. Through his actions, Abimelech displayed all the worst characteristics that people see in royalty narcissistic, vengeful, ambitious, and all-powerful. And while those are the traits of many earthly kings, they bear no resemblance to our heavenly king. As you can imagine, Abimelech's three-year reign ended in a murderous mess. He used the army not to keep the peace, but to instill fear in the hearts of his opponents. And Abimelech's life ended appropriately so, I believe. He was going around and waging battle with anyone who opposed him, even people in his own country who opposed him. He would wage war against them and wipe them out. The lords of Shechem who installed him as king, they were all killed by Abimelech's army. Then the people of Thebes said, Abimelech, we're not going to support you. We're not sending any money in to support you. We oppose you, Abimelech. He said, okay, get the troops. Let's go to Thebes. And so they did. Thebes happened to have a tall tower in the middle of their town to which the residents would retreat when foreign opposition would come to them. And they would, you know, use stones or bricks or bows and arrows and spears to throw down from above where they were safe in their tower. That's exactly what they did when Abimelech brought all of the armed forces and surrounded the Tower of Thebes. Abimelech was there and all of his warriors. And then one brave woman up in the tower took a large stone, dropped it, 
and Abimelech was in the wrong place. His skull was fractured. He was mortally wounded and about to die, but then told his armor bearer, take my sword and you finish the job. I never want to be remembered as the one who was killed by a woman. Of course, the irony is that Abimelech will forever be remembered as the awful king who died when a civilian female just happened to drop a rock out of the window that landed right on his skull. Israel had delayed having a king for good reason. Many ancient monarchs behaved just like the wretched Abimelech did, taking the power and believing the power was theirs alone, that they were really something in this world simply because of the title they held. Of course, I'd like to believe today that not, not all monarchs are worthless bloodthirsty fools like Abimelech, but they all are earthly rulers. The only monarch who is truly different is Christ our Lord. Jesus offers a different model of one who reigns. He rules over this world with truth and grace. His compassion is never ending. His love is intended for all to know. Jesus is the only king who rules with the goal of making peace for all in this world. That is the peace of Christ. The great description of Christ our Lord is found in Colossians. I want to share these words as I conclude. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. On this final Sunday of the liturgical year, we celebrate Jesus' reign in glory and power, now and forever. Give praise and honor the King of kings and the Lord of lords who offers grace, peace, and salvation. Amen. The piece that the choir has chosen to sing for Christ the King Sunday is O God Beyond All Praising. Uh, it's known in the, in the church tunes as Thaxted. The melody is written by Gustav Holst. It was one of the melodies that he used in the planets. Um, it's on page 366 in your hymnal, and you have two verses. We have four, but I thought you might like to see the words. They're, they're pretty impactful. Um, o God Beyond All Praising.
Gracious God, we bring our treasure to lay at your feet. May we treasure each day given as a gift to us. And may we use this in each day to serve you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand firm in your faith, and may all that you say and do be done to the glory and honor of God, whom we worship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 